This is an overview of the basic features of how to use Top Braid Enterprise Vocabulary Net. The Top Quadrant's website at topquadrant.com has some short videos which drill down a little further into some aspects of using Top Braid EVN such as workflow and change management. First, a little bit about the company Top Quadrant. Um, five or six years ago, Top Quadrant was selling the Top Braid platform as an easy way to build applications that took advantage of semantic web standards, RDF, Sparkle, and so forth. Um, many of the customers shown here um, use this platform to build custom applications either on their own or with our help. Um, and some of them would come to us and say, could we use your platform to build a multi-user vocabulary manager? And we said, sure. And we'd put together a little demo for them. And this happened enough times that we finally decided, um, let's take our time user platform and build an application and, and make that available to customers as a solution to fit a specific business need. So that's what TopRate EVN is. Since then, we've used our TopRate platform to create other solutions, such as TopRate Insight, which is a virtual data warehouse, and TopRate Reference Data Manager. Having that top braid platform underneath it all, though, makes it very easy to um, add new features, to configure new, um, new re requirements that customers may need. Um, so that customization, the addition of new reports, new web services, doesn't mean we have to dig out some Java source code and write new code and make a custom version for them. It can all be done through configuration. Um, so again, some of the customers who've used our various products, note in particular how Mayo Clinic is not under life sciences, but under digital media. That's because they use top rate EVN um, as part of a publishing platform. They developed mayoclinic.edu, mayoclinic.com, mayoclinic.org. These websites were developed independently when they wanted to combine them into a single one and integrate them all and integrate their metadata. They're, they've been using top rate EVN to integrate that metadata to assign keywords to um, articles about health on their website so that their customers can more easily find them. So EVN is a web-based solution. Um, it installs on a central server and then people log in um, from the web um, to do track both taxonomies and ontologies. We use the term vocabularies more broadly to refer to taxonomies, ontologies, and thesauruses. And people curate this data and the metadata about the terms um, in these vocabularies to aid in search across content, to improve searches, um, to integrate data from multiple sources, um, all the classic use, uses that people put vocabularies to. The N in EVN, the Enterprise Vocabulary Net, is about how it lets you um, create a network of vocabularies. For example, let's say if you got EVN and you were assembling a pilot project. Uh, and then you started a separate pilot project somewhere else in your enterprise that was unrelated to the first one to try out EVN on something else. And then you realized after a few months that um, maybe they weren't unrelated. Maybe you do want to have connections between them. Well, that's very easy with EVN to say after the fact, this term in this vocabulary has this relationship to this other term in this other vocabulary. That relationship might be um, a standard one, like broader or narrower or um, related, or it might be a custom one that you define. You can define custom properties, uh, relationship properties, data type properties, just by filling out a form in EVN. So um, this ability to um, grow incrementally, to grow organically, means you don't have to start off with some giant top-down plan. You can start small and grow and connect things up as you move forward. We have had customers come to us and say, we need a taxonomy manager because I found out that different people in our company are using the same word to mean different things. Um, we have to put a stop to that. We need to have a central definition so everyone knows what everyone else is talking about. And that sounds good in theory, but um, in practice, it can be difficult in a really large organization because sometimes different people have perfectly good reasons for using the same term differently. A classic example is the word customer. In the repair department, a customer is someone who walks in the door with a broken thing to fix. In the marketing department, a customer is more of a modeling construct, a construct used to do forecasting and planning. If you force both the repair department and the marketing department to use the same definition of the term, you're not serving either of them very well. So in many organizations, what happens when people need their own separate definitions is they do it on spreadsheets. And workflow means sending each other emails with spreadsheets attached. You know, I send you one saying, um, here's the new version, ignore the spreadsheet I sent this morning, this has John's corrections. That leaves a lot of cracks for things to fall through when you try to do it that way. When you can manage 
distributed sets of vocabularies, but connect them, you have the best of both worlds in letting different groups maintain their own data, but still be able to connect them. You can search across them. You can find connections between them. And that's what top rate EVN lets you do. Um, top rate EVN is built on these standards from the W3C. The W3C is the same standards body that gave us HTML and CSS, the foundation of the World Wide Web, um, XML. These standards um, are what they call semantic web standards. And we have plenty of people using RDA, using um, EVN who've never even heard of these standards. When you use EVN, you're filling out dialog boxes, you're clicking and dragging, you're picking things off of menus. Underneath it's using these standards. Um, and if you do know anything about these standards, you can get even more out of EVM. For the people who don't know about the standards, it's still reassuring to know that it conforms to these standards. It's like knowing that the wiring in your house is up to code. You might not be interested in the code itself, but it's still reassuring to know that it meets the standards. Um, meeting the standards means that the data you save is interoperable with other data. Uh, it means that the program itself is inter interoperable with other commercial and open source tools. And the data that you save is not being saved in some binary format that Top Quadrant's engineers made up, but an open published standard. Um, the standards, RDF, is a simple data format that's much more flexible than the tables used in relational databases. Sparkle is the query language for RDF. RDFS and OWL are ways to define data models for um, RDF to say, I want to have a class called person and a subclass called employee with properties, first name and last name. And there are various of these OWL ontologies for different domains such as um, life sciences or e-commerce. The W3C defined a specific OWL ontology for taxonomists, and that's what SCOS is. Um, it defines the things they need, like uh, properties like broader, narrower, scope note, history note. So we built EVN on top of SCOS, um, but a really nice thing about the fact that this, this basis in OWL is that it's extensible. All OWL ontologies are extensible, including SCOS. So if you want to define your own properties, um, which you can do in EVN by just filling out a form, um, this makes it a lot easier. One thing that a lot of people really like about EVN are the data quality rules. There are some built in and some that you can define yourself. Of the built in ones, for example, um, the SCOS standard that we saw mentioned on the previous screen um, has uh, a couple of constraints defined. For example, it says that for a given concept, if you have a certain preferred label in a certain language, um, don't, uh, don't give it an alternative label of the same thing. If you have a concept where the English word is dog, and then say the alternative label for this concept in English is dog, that's not much of an alternative. So um, the SCOS standard is saying, don't do that. Um, there is no way, though, in the OWL ontology included with the SCOS standard to enforce that. But with top rate EVN, we do have technology that makes it easy to enforce that. Some of the other bullets shown on here are things that customers wanted to do. They're not all necessarily things that are built in. Um, to conform to certain standards like that term, you know, if you want to make sure that all the terms begin with an uppercase letter, you can define your own rules, often by just filling out a form to say, this value must be between these, um, these two values, or this value must be a specific combination of um, numbers and digits. Um, you can do that just by filling out a form, and then you can use batches of your own rules, um, and we'll see it in action. The, uh, I'm going to show you how if I violate one of the constraints, um, it alerts me right away. Um, in addition to being alerted right away, EVN also includes a report you can run as a way to say, are any of the rules that we defined uh, broken with the data now? Which is really nice, um, like for example, after importing some data from a spreadsheet or something like that to check that it makes um, it meets all of your rules. Another um, feature that people really like is the concept of working copies. If I'm editing a taxonomy called treatment categories and um, I have nine changes I want to make, I could just go in and edit the production copy, uh, make those nine changes, and then they would be um, immediately available, the new version, uh, the nine changes, to all the people, all the systems using the data. But what I'd be more likely to do would be to create what's called a working copy. A working copy is a virtual sandboxed copy of the production copy that doesn't affect the production copy. I can make all the changes I want to the working copy and it will not be reflected in the production copy. I could grant coworkers the ability to edit that working copy with me or maybe just, um, maybe just grant them permission to see it. Um, this way we can have some governance. We can put proposed changes through a workflow. We can run reports on it that we'll see. Um, 
until we're absolutely sure that this set of proposed changes is um, that we really do want to put it into production and then someone with the appropriate permission can then put it into production. So this idea of um, working copies really makes um, nice data governance possible. Um, these are some of the roles that can be assigned both at the working copy level and at the production vocabulary level. So we're going to take a look um, now at EVN. Um, two of the text, the two taxonomies that are included with it, um, the International Press Telecommunications Council, they are a uh, in the UK, a um, news standards organization. They came out with a taxonomy of terms to assign to news stories, such as to say, this is a story about rugby, or this is a story about an earthquake, or this is a story about an election. Um, they published it in SCOS, because SCOS as a standard does have a lot of traction. We loaded it up into EVN, it looked great. And so we asked them, could we include your taxonomy with our product? And they said, sure, as long as you give us credit. We're mostly going to be looking at the geography one, which is one that we created because it helps to um, it helps to show off all the different features, especially customization of um, of top rate EVN or a customization of a particular taxonomy. So here we see the two taxonomies. There's also a tab for editing ontologies, which I'll discuss more. Um, tagging, crosswalks, some other things. We're going to jump into geography. And we see there's a couple of um, working copies already. One is frozen for review. Um, Jane Smith has one that she called Region 3 Edits. One has been rejected. We're going to create a new one. And we'll call it EVN Demo. And we'll add a description just so that you can see where that description shows up. And on the working copy screen, there's the description right underneath, right there, another uncommitted working copy. So I'm going to go into that working copy. It has its own menu of, um, we can add comments, um, user roles. For example, I can grant Jane, I could grant her privilege to be editor. I'm just going to have her be a viewer right now. So she can see my uh, the changes I make to this EVN demo working copy, but she can't make her own edits. Um, import. Um, this workflow tab, um, if I was going to put this through a, a series of stages as part of a data governance process, I could freeze it for review, send everyone an email and say, we're putting this into production next Friday. Give me uh, any comments by Tuesday. I'll reject the changes. If Jane logged in and looked at this working copy, she wouldn't even see this tab workflow because she's only been assigned a role of viewer. So the workflow tab does not show up. Um, someone who's just a viewer does not have access to um, execute these steps. All right, let's take a look at the working copy itself. And we'll see that, as with a lot of taxonomy editors, there's a hierarchy of terms. Um, this search form here, I'm going to hide that for now. We'll come back to that. We have a hierarchy we can drill down with the terms. If we select a particular term, it shows us information about it in the screen. The information um, in this case includes some standard pieces of the standard that you typically have with um, a taxonomy, preferred labels in different languages, um, the broader relationship. Algeria has a broader value of Africa. It has a related value of North Africa. And we can see that for this taxonomy, someone has defined some custom properties as well that aren't part of the standard. And as I mentioned before, these can be defined simply by just filling out a form. Some of these custom properties, like some of the standard ones, are just strings of text or numbers. But the one for capital, like the one for has related and broader, is a hypertext link. It's a relationship property. We say that Algeria has a capital of something that is another concept in this taxonomy. By doing it that way, um, it automatically becomes a hypertext link. I followed that to Algeria, uh, to Algiers, the city, which is the capital. And notice how I then returned to where I was going using my browser back button. Um, we can navigate with the browser buttons, and at top quadrant, Everyone uses all the different browsers. I mean, it, it works fine in recent releases of Firefox and Chrome and Safari and Internet Explorer. So there's no specific one you have to use. So we've seen navigation by following hypertext links by drilling down into the tree. We also have two kinds of search, something called quick search. If I just type in a few letters, it will show me everything that begins with those letters and I can jump right to one of them. It will also line up there on the tree. And then we have this um, search form here that is more powerful because it lets you search by any bits of metadata, including if you have any customizations within your taxonomy. For example, in this case, there's the cust customized concept um, type of country um, where we've assigned uh, custom properties. We can search on the custom properties. So while area is certainly not a property of SCOS, if I say I want to search all of the countries with an area between 100 and 300 kilometers 
but uh, and I clicked the checkbox there so it would actually return that value, but only the ones with L-A-N-D in their name. So when I search, there they are. Um, I can sort by the return values. I can click on one of them and it will take me right to it in the form in the middle and on the tree. So there's uh, British Virgin Islands. I can um, save. There's a lot of things we can do in search results. Um, the one I want to highlight is that we can export the search results to a tab separated value file so that can be imported into Excel. So you can slice and dice the data a lot of different ways on this. Um, if I'm wondering you know, do any of my concepts have a hidden label value? I could say search for where there's any value. Or let's say I want to know is anyone missing a preferred label? I could, I could say search where any of them has no value. So there's all different ways to slice and dice the data here. And then when you could save them in a tab separated value file, it's like report generation. I mean, we'll see there's a tab that includes um, various built-in reports, but you have a lot of flexibility with this to pull out different subsets of data. In addition to saving the results of the search, we can save the search itself so that I could come back. Let's say tonight someone adds a new country that's 150 kilometers in square feet, square uh, in area, and tomorrow I could rerun my saved query and I will see the search results updated. But what's particularly interesting about this saved search is that each saved search is assigned a URL that can be used as a web service. So if you had some other system that needed to retrieve um, an updated list of small land countries every night or every hour or every minute, um, it could use a URL like this and you can tweak the URL. We can see near the end it says format equals CSV. If you want, you could change that to JSON or XML depending on what your other systems needed. So this, this is just one. We're gonna see other ways to define web services as well. What I like about this one is um, by doing it through the save search, somebody who's never even heard of web services can essentially define a web service because they're um, saving a search and then someone else can look up and see this is a way that other systems can remotely retrieve that information. So those are the basics of searching. Uh, the rest is covered in the um, documentation like those drop down windows, drop down lists. Um, I'm going to show a little bit about editing now. So we see, I don't know, 10, 15 pieces of information about Algeria. When we click the edit button, it shows the information already entered about Algeria, and it also um, shows the custom properties as well, such as um, such as um, altitude, area, and so forth. Um, when we have multiple values of something, we can add additional ones. For example, I'm going to say we don't have uh, the Spanish one here, so I'm going to add that Argelia, and I'll say it has a uh, it's in Spanish. And this drop-down list, pretty much any drop-down list you see in top rate EVN can be configured. You can have more values on it, you can have less values on it. If you wanted your language list to be shorter or to include country codes to say British English and American English, you can do that. I'm now going to break one of those rules I described earlier and say that Algeria has a, an alternative label of Algeria in English. Um, one other thing I'll add, there's a couple of these um, properties that are rich text fields, so like definition is. So I could say, I could format um, format these, I could have, turn them into hypertext links to other concepts, just the way the Algeria one linked to Algiers. I could have hypertext links to the web, I could insert images. All right, I'm going to save my changes now, and a pop-up message box tells me that I've violated a particular constraint. A concept can't have the same value in the same language in both. Are you sure you want to do this? I'm going to say, no, I'm not sure. And I'm going to give it a proper of Algeria. So then it lets me save that. The new values show up here. Um, now, EVN tracks all the changes anyone makes. Um, throughout, and there are various ways to access that information. One simple one is if I click Show History here, it shows me that um, a couple of these values have been added. We see the green background. It would also show me if any had been deleted. I can revert those changes. Um, that's one way to see, for to keep track of who's been doing what. I could also add comments. The zero here shows that there are zero comments. So I'm adding a comment to a coworker, and now this shows with a one that there's one comment. And other people can see this. Um, they can be threaded. They can have statuses assigned to them. One other thing I'd like to show about editing and um, tracking of who's doing what. Let's say with West Indies, I'm going to 
edit that, and I'm going to change its English label from West English to Caribbean. And then I remember that at a meeting of the taxonomy management staff, we were talking about editing this one and making changes to it. So I'm wondering, has anyone else been editing Caribbean um, in any other working copies? And does anyone else have proposed changes for it? From this menu, I can pick Show Affected Working Copies, and it shows that there are two working copies where this one has been edited. There's EVN Demo, the one I'm creating now, and then there's Region 3 Edits. Jane Smith, um, in her working copy called Region 3 Edits, she has added a scope note. Um, she didn't change the name if she had changed the English name, just something I would know that I need to get in touch with her. We, we need to coordinate it. So this is one other way to keep track of who made what changes when. Um, there's a report that we can run, View Change History, where um, it'll show all, I could fill out this form at the top to um, narrow it down, but I'm going to say just show me all the changes. And we can see that this last change here at 2.20, um, someone logged in as administrator, added West Indies, uh, added a preferred label of Caribbean, and deleted the value of West Indies. I could commit one of these individual changes to production. When I described working copies earlier, I talked about committing the whole batch, the whole working copy to production, but we don't have to do that. It can be at a more granular level to revert the change or commit the change. Um, this ability, well, let's take a look at some of the other reports besides that one. Um, constraint violations report, we saw when I said that Algeria had an alternative label of Algeria that I violated a constraint. The constraint violations report is a way to say, show me any violations anywhere in this data set, which is especially nice after doing an import, like after importing a spreadsheet or something like that, that you can check whether um, there are any data problems with it. Um, comparison report, spell check I'm not going to run because with the geography one, because there's a lot of names it doesn't recognize, but it shows you which concepts have uh, the problems and which properties. Comparison report is a way to compare this working copy with the current production copy. So when I run that, um, a lot of these here are about that saved search because the saved search is part of the working copy as well and it's not in the production copy. If we scroll down though, we can see for example that where um, uh, West Indies has a, uh, in the production copy of West Indies, a preferred label of West Indies, but in the working copy, it's Caribbean. Were there others deleted? No, those are some other reports. These reports work well with the workflow when we, um, for example, freeze for review. We don't have a specific workflow you have to follow. Um, we give you pieces of a workflow that you can mix and match to whatever um, fits your, your needs the best. For example, I, like I said, I could have edited the production copy directly. I chose to create a working copy. I could freeze it for review. Uh, freezing it for review is a good time to run some of these reports before putting it into production. Approve and publish, rework. Um, these are all options that are up to up to you. Um, importing spreadsheets, a lot of customers, you know, when they come to us, one of the reasons they do it is because they've been man managing taxonomies using spreadsheets, and they they need they want to scale up from there. And top braid EVN can manage um, import spreadsheets very well. If it's, a, if it's a taxonomy hierarchy, people represent hierarchies in different ways on spreadsheets, and we have found several common patterns. So when you tell it you want to import a spreadsheet, it then asks you which of those patterns. Here we see that someone has just said they want to import a spreadsheet of regions of Antarctica. So EVN is asking, okay, which of these patterns does it match up with? Um, I guess column-based tree would be it. So if I click that, it would then ask me, um, it would then ask me which pieces of information are where. And not only can it import these terms, it can import any additional metadata here, even if it's not part of the standard. Um, if you define any special properties, you can import data from um, spreadsheets into your special properties as well. I recently learned about how Google um, publishes a product taxonomy. Um, so if you have an e-commerce site and you want to make sure that your products um, are easy to find on Google, you might want to call their product category the same thing Google does. So you can download the spreadsheet to see. I downloaded the spreadsheet. Um, I added one single row at the top because top rate EVN, when it imports a spreadsheet, um, it assumes that the top row is um, column names uh, as opposed to um, actual data. So animals and pet supplies, that's not the name of this column. So I put this up here so it wouldn't turn that into a uh, column name. That's all I did. I, imp I uh, inserted that blank top row. And then when I pulled it into EVN, it looked great. It laid it all nice in a hierarchy. Um, so 
that was a nice example to see of a, of a public um, well-known spreadsheet on the web, how easily top-rate EVN could import it. And many of our customers, um, when they use our evalu an evaluation server, for example, import their data without needing any help. Um, and we have plenty of people to help if necessary. Sometimes a spreadsheet might need a few tweaks. Um, Top rate EVN can support um, multiple languages as well. I mean, you can see in this example where Algeria is spelled out in Cyrillic for the Russian entry, but also these, it's very easy to configure it so that things like these property names here, which are shown in English, preferred label, has broader, has related to here they're shown in German, and so forth um, here in Russian. That's easy to configure. Um, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, they published a taxonomy, a, a thesaurus, I guess they called it, which is like a taxonomy with additional metadata of food production terms. And um, that was in SCOS, uh, conformed to the standard. We brought it up into EVN, and you can see how well Japanese, um, Arabic, um, Chinese, how well it can handle the full Unicode. Oh, there's some Arabic down there. EVN's ontology editor, we saw the tab earlier. Um, the ontology editor is part of EVN. You can edit ontologies as well as taxonomies. I like to think of the difference being that taxonomy is a controlled vocabulary, typically in a hierarchy, a controlled vocabulary of terms that people may add as metadata to um, may add as metadata to um, content to make it easier to find the content. So if I have the word dog, I might tag the book Lassie Come Home or Rin Tin Tin with that, and then when people are searching for books about dogs, it makes it easier to find it. Um, people use it to, to much for sophisticated uses as well, but taxonomies, um, um, bits of controlled vocabulary to use as metadata. An ontology I think of as a data model um, uh, to define classes and to define properties. You can do it from scratch, or what many of our customers do, they'll take, there's a, a standard ontology in their domain, in their business, and they want to maybe customize it or use it for something. Here we can see someone's taken the schema.org ontology developed by Google and Yahoo and some search engines, um, downloaded that because it was available as an OWL ontology, added some customizations, and they added some instance data. We can see this ontology editor, someone has selected a class, and there are the instances of the class. Um, information about the selected ones showing, we can see that the search form, which looks like the search form we saw before, has all the relevant properties here. So the ontology editor can edit any of the any um, data model conforming to these W3C standards, RDFS and OWL. It lets you create new ones from scratch, um, customize existing ones, and we saw the ability to search and create instances, and it can also do all of these features we saw earlier um, about EVN. You can have working copies, um, you can import, assign people roles, define constraints, see the history, do search, and so forth. So many of our customers are using both ontology editor and um, and um, taxonomy editor to, to, to be complementary or taking data in one, shifting it to the other. We have a white paper on our website that um, describes a little more about taxonomies versus ontologies, which, pe which one people are more likely to use when. Um, when you license EVN, the license fee is based on the number of editing users. So if it's one to five people, it's one price. If it's six to 10, it's another and so on. We have a couple of optional add-ons um, and one of them is called Top Rate Vocabulary Explorer. Explorer lets you expose the interface in a read-only way to thousands of people, if you like, without paying for thousands of license seats. Um, as you can see, the Explorer interface looks pretty much just like EVNs, except there's no edit button. You could, if you get this server, you could make it available to all the employees in your company, or um, I think, guess we have one flat price if it's up to 5,000 people, another if it's more than 5,000 people, if you wanted to put it on the public web or something like that. So people can drill down on the tree, they can follow hypertext links, they can do searches, they just can't edit. Um, um, they can add comments. If they click the comment button, they can fill out a um, dialog box to have a comment that then gets passed back to one of the licensed users who can see a list of them and assign them some status or so forth. So this is a nice way to get input from a large, large number of people without necessarily licensing them all as um, official users. Another optional add-on is called Tagger. Um, what Tagger does is it lets you take a curated taxonomy, in this case we see the IPTC one in the upper right here, and assign and, and tag articles with it or tag content with it. Someone has a list of um, articles from a website here 
and this one, Letting Go Can Empower Caregivers, has been selected, and someone has assigned it a main subject of Alzheimer's caregiver, a secondary subject of healthy aging. This main subject versus secondary subject, that's part of what you configure when you set up a tag set in EVN. You say, I want to use these relationships to assign um, information from this taxonomy to this content. So this is done manually. Um, it's a way for um, to hand curate the relationships between the taxonomies uh, terms and the um, and the content. We also have an auto classifier which automates this. It uses machine learning. You give it um, a couple of sets of um, of tag content so it can look for patterns, and then it can use what it found from those patterns to automatically tag an additional sets. Those automatic tags that it adds are put into a working copy. They're not put into production so that a human can review them. So we see, for example, here the auto classifier has um, assigned these key terms to this article, double blind evaluation, something, something. Um, so someone can approve or reject individual ones. They can put this through the same workflow as any other proposed changes. To integrate um, top rated EVN with other systems, I mean, you're not curating a taxonomies and ontologies just for fun. You're doing it so that it can support your other systems. Um, in addition to importing, it can export in a variety of formats. It's easy to configure new formats for it to export. Um, and so it can do that in batch, but it can also integrate with other systems dynamically using web services um, so that they can make requests on the fly. It can send things to them. Um, one of our solution architects once did a little demo where creating a, um, a simple little web page, this is outside of EVN, a simple little web page that when someone entered a search term, in this case Motrin, if the unenhanced radio button was selected, then when you click search, it would send that search term to a National Library of Medicine website uh, where people discuss health issues, and it would then show all the articles that mentioned Motrin. So that's pretty boring. Um, if you clicked Auto Enhanced, though, what it would do when you click Search is it would send that search term to Top Rate EVN uh, via Web Services, which would then return additional information that might be useful. For example, when, when this was done, EVN had loaded up some data about, um, about some medicines, so it saw that Motrin was actually an alternative term for a concept whose preferred term was ibuprofen, so it sent that back. So this web page with its Perl script behind it was able to change, to enhance the search based on this extra information that it retrieved from EVN via web services so it could send the query Motrin or Ibuprofen to Medline Plus. Because if I'm wondering, will, my, will Motrin help my sore shoulder? The real question is, will Ibuprofen help my sore shoulder? Because that's the active ingredient. So enhancing search is one thing that, from the background, is one thing that EVN can do. More importantly, it's an example of of how um, other applications, can, even a simple one like this, can interact with it dynamically to have their own operations enhanced, um, interact via RESTful web services. Uh, on Top Quadrant's website, on the web page, there is a video that goes into more detail about how this was all done, how the other radio buttons got used. So um, there are four levels of web services um, to use when integrating with other systems. One, there are some built-in web services. For example, there's one called Narrower. If I um, sent a, a URL request via HTTP to say, I want to call that narrower web service, and I pass it a parameter of Canada, uh, and say, run this against the geography taxonomy, what EVN is going to do, it's going to run that web service, and it will return um, a list of the provinces in Canada. Because though, you know, Saskatchewan, Ontario, those are the values in the geography taxonomy that have a broader value of Canada. Um, so there's several built-in ones. We saw that you can define new ones just by saving a search. Um, and then you can define additional new ones using the tools um, that are part of the top rate platform. Um, sometimes these can be done in 15 minutes um, to create a simple, um, for someone who's familiar with the W3C query language Sparkle, it's really just a matter of putting the, a, a Sparkle query, sometimes a very short one, in the right place and defining the parameters. And then someone can, you, you can see what the URL would be for another system to call it. Um, if you want the data returned in CSV or JSON or XML or even a custom format, that's not difficult to configure either. If you have some specific XML, DTD, or schema that you've developed at your organization and you want the web service to return it using that format, um, that's very straightforward as well. And for people who are familiar with um, these standards, 
um, EVN can also act as what's known as a Sparkle endpoint, a web service where you can send it arbitrary Sparkle queries, queries conforming to that standard. And whichever system sends it, if it's been authenticated, it will then um, can return them. And that's um, read-only and update queries as well. Um, this I'm not going to go into too much detail on. One of the top braid um, tools for building applications is called Sparkle Motion. It's a scripting language. Um, where we take these various modules and we hook them up together and configure them. Um, the night, one of the nice things about it is that some of the modules let you call other web services. So when I define a web service using Sparkle Motion, here's the URL I would use to call it, it can also call other web services so that web service integration with EVN can be two-way. I've been describing a lot how other systems can call EVN, but EVN can call other systems to ping them about new information or however you wanted to set it up to integrate with those systems. Um, so this is an overview of most of the features we've seen. Um, customization, I've talked about the top braid platform. Um, merging, uh, I've talked about importing Excel. We can pull in various other formats as well. A top braid can accommodate XML and so forth, integrate with other systems, um, can scale weight up, can integrate with LDAP um, for single sign-on. Um, rules, change tracking, import XML, I think we've covered all of these. And so that is our overview of top braid enterprise for Cabaret Net. Um, if you'd like to have a, a personal demo of this or um, discuss some of your own organization's needs, um, vocabulary needs, and how you can help achieve them with top-rate EVN, um, we'd love to give you a demo. So please um, send us an email.